Good evening and welcome. La Trobe University acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. My name is Jane Hamilton and I'm Dean and Head of the La Trobe Business School. On behalf of the University, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth Bold Thinking Series panel discussion for 2018. There will be three other Bold Thinking events between now and November here at the newly refurbished State Library Theatrette. In light of the smashed avocado intergenerational debate started by demographer Bernard Salt, tonight we ask whether there is a war on youth. Do baby boomers understand the current challenges facing millennials or are they too busy spending their inheritance to care? Have these challenges always been there throughout the ages or are they new? And do other generations really understand what it's like for young people in this age of disruption and the gig economy? Tonight's conversation will consider whether larger social, technological and economic forces have made things harder for young people today. What are the best solutions for young people to the twin issues that they face of secure employment and affordable housing? So I'd like to introduce the panel and on the far side, your left, we'll start with Dr. Sarah James, who is a cultural sociologist and a lecturer at La Trobe's Department of Social Inquiry. Her research focuses on the changing role of work in people's lives in an era when work is increasingly characterised by flexibility, uncertainty and precariousness. Her recent book, Making a Living, Making a Life, Work, Meaning and Self-Identity, draws on in-depth interviews and cultural analyses to investigate the significance of work today with a focus on vocation and the work ethic. Sarah has also written on maker culture, work and authenticity, professional women's identities in retirement and students' vocational aspirations. Next to Sarah, <coughs> excuse me, next to Sarah, our second panellist is Natalie O'Brien, Chief of Staff at social change organisation Get Up. She has worked on a range of economic fairness campaigns since 2013, including Medicare, hospital cuts, university fee deregulation, cuts to New Start, tax justice, fair trade, democratic integrity, and a strong social safety net. Joining them is Melissa Brown, uh, third, on, fourth on your uh, cross from your left. Melissa is an author and serial entrepreneur. She is CEO of the award-winning accounting and advisory firm ANTA, which stands for Accounting and Taxation Advantage, a business catering for 28 to 48-year-olds who want to financially grow up. She has written three books and also writes a fortnightly money column for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. She is a regular media commentator, writing and speaking for everyone from Cosmopolitan to CEO Magazine to Weekend Sunrise to Triple J. And finally, our fourth speaker is Dave DeGarris. David is an, a La Trobe alumnus and the Director Economics for Markets at the National Australia Bank. He writes for the bank's morning Markets Today, an early morning market podcast. He speaks regularly with the financial media and has appeared on Sky Business, on the ABC, CNBC, Bloomberg TV, as well as with regional TV and in the print media. Earlier in his career, David spent more than a decade in Canberra, finishing his time there as a senior economic advisor in the then Prime Minister Bob Hawke's Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I wonder what David thinks about today's events. <laughs> so I will now hand over to tonight's host, broadcaster, journalist and writer, Francis Leach, the rose in the middle, and the panel. Please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thank you all for being here this evening. I know you'd rather be at home counting numbers, handing out your <laughs> petitions, getting your 43 signatures and having a crack at being Prime Minister. Because I think <laughs> if you can get 43 names on a piece of paper tonight, the job is yours. My, my petition's out the front there for you to sign on the way out. Uh, this discussion is one that uh, has been... Uh, superheated or hyperventilated in recent times because of that infamous article we're going to talk about. But the issues that were raised 
at the time are very real for people, uh, for young people, and for uh, the generation who were the subject of much of the baby boomers as well along the way. So tonight we're going to investigate that, and then we're going to invite you to ask some questions of our panellists as well. I want to start with a quote from, from something I read today. Younger people just can't get it right. They're either full of piercing or complete prudes. Whatever the case, they just aren't it. Sarah, that was from Mark Davis's book, Gangland, in 1997, mm. The Generation Wars. There's nothing new about them then, is there? No, we've always had this. We've always had this <laughs> pattern of um, the old blaming the young and the young blaming the old. Um, I think probably the reason, though, that we've seen boomers and millennials so strongly um, in the last few years is that, obviously, millennials are the children of the boomers and we are getting to that point in our lives, late 20s, early 30s, where you're really trying to establish your independence from your parents. And then we have all these stories in the news about so-called kid alts who refuse to grow up and won't move out of home. Um, but of course, there's so many structural challenges that young people are facing in doing that, which we'll get into, I'm sure, in a moment. Um, so there's that, um, and then at the same time you have the boomers who have just come out the other side of the GFC, some of them who were retired having to come out of that because of loss of um, finances through that. So this financial insecurity and housing insecurity, as well as trying to balance care and work duties, are actually things that both boomers and millennials are finding tough at the moment. So I think that's one of the reasons that this debate has kind of um, flared up in the last few years, aside from the infamous avocado gate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and everyone, every generation defines itself against the generation that went before. But this is interesting because this debate sort of forgets a generation in the middle, my generation, Generation X. <laughs> It's, it's been pitched, exactly. <laughs> but it has been pitched, it's been pitched as a, as a uh, you know, the tension is between boomers and millennials. Why is that the case, do you think? Uh, see, I'm a cynic about this whole narrative. Like, it, to my mind, the, this uh, narrative of entitlement around young people is not actually something that my parents' generation or baby boomers are alleging. It's like a very deliberate conservative political narrative because it is much more expedient to say the reason that people are upset is because we have these entitled youth who are out of touch and who um, want to, I don't know, go eat brunch and have a house. Um, and I like I really think that what it ignores is that there's been successive governments who have made deliberate choices about the way we structure our economy um, and like that, in telling this narrative of intergenerational warfare, it ignores the role of the politicians and the way the politicians have created a system that works for some and not for others. Mr. So do you see the same way that it's a, a political construct? The, the there is definitely uh, political aspects. I mean, negative gearing has meant that it is more attractive for people to buy a house and that there are, that, that is where we're going to try and get our wealth from because we get these tax benefits from it. So there are more, and now that super funds can buy homes and they can borrow to do so, it means that there's this one thing, this utopian ideal that we have that everyone is trying to attack and have. So I think there is political constructs, but I think there's also... There is so much more as well, um, I, but I think there is, I think that every generation looks back at the one and says, but why did you do that and leave me in the position that I'm in? I don't think that this is a new thing that we're facing. But there is something new about it in a way because, and David, Bernard Salt's article, mm. I read it again today, mm. And it's actually, if you read it, it's actually quite flippant and a little bit, a little bit cheeky. <laughs> yeah, cheek, yeah right. like he's just, it's an absolute wind-up in a yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. But and I'll just read if you if you if you haven't read it recently, I'll read the part that really set people off. I've seen young people order smashed avocado with crumbled feta on five grain toast bread at, a to at twenty dollars a pop or more. I can afford to eat this for lunch because I'm middle aged and have raised my family. But how can young people afford to eat like this? Shouldn't they be economising by eating at home? How often are they eating out? $22 several times a week could go towards a deposit on a house. Now, dare I suggest fundamentally he's correct <laughs> that, you, that it, it, it is an issue of saving involved in this and that 
that's part of the issue here. There's lots of, there's lots of factors involved. Now, look, as you all will understand, I'm the baby boomer on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that's responsible for all the problems that we have. That's why you're here tonight. <laughs> I know, we're here to blame you. <laughs> there's lots of factors involved. You know, the changing nature of work that we've seen mm. in the past 20 to 30 years, and that change is continuing as we see it right now. Mm -hmm. Our education and training systems, expectations, what people want for life, what do they want to spend, what do they want to save, the supply of housing. There's lots of factors. It's, and it is nice to sort of put things in a nice little box because that mm -hmm. sounds very appealing. But I think the answer is much more complex than that, Francis. Maybe we'll, we'll develop that a little bit more tonight. But I'm interested, Sarah, why did that particular comment and quip, it's kind of become, in the way that Donald Horne's comment about the lucky country, which is mm. vastly misunderstood, like that was an mm. ironic, you know, mm. assessment of what Australia yes. had become. Uh, that became a, genera a defining generational statement. This has become defining and generational as well. Why do you think this one touched such a raw nerve? Well, my theory is that it's because it's about hipsters. <laughs> and no one, I mean, everybody loves to attack hipsters, right? And there's part of it in the article where he complains about going to cafes and spending $50 on brunch and having to sit on milk crates. So there's an element... Eating a sandwich off a, off a board. Or yeah, yeah, there's no drink toilets. drink out, out of a jar. All of this, yeah. all of this. So I think, I think it's attached to that and hipsters sort of being attacked for... Um, a sense that they're cooler than everybody, um, that they're a bit inauthentic, um, but also sort of being the cause of gentrification as well. That's another, I've got a great PhD student doing a um, thesis on that. But I think it was that sort of association with that, those kinds of cafes that really was part of it. And of course the accusation is that, you know, these are irresponsible lifestyle habits and blame it, um, millennials should be blamed. But is there a point here that maybe saving is something that millennials don't do? Is that is that so, is that unfair that you shouldn't be eating your twenty two dollar <laughs> avocado on toast? I mean, and I if you're saving for a housing deposit, like a lot of people did, they didn't go out for breakfast. I swore I wouldn't get on this panel tonight. I wouldn't get into the like breakdowns of how many smashed avocados you have to eat in order to. <laughs> Bad yeah, luck. Equal we a need to know. <laughs> deposit. No, but I, I mean, I think fundamentally this is about power, um, and I think if we if we are like even if uh, we are having this conversation now about smashed avocado instead of having a conversation about what we should be having a conversation about which is about the way in which the economy is stacked against young people and how like subsequent tax concessions negative gearing super tax concessions have me. built <laughs> have built an economic structure that is has excluded young people and so when we you know people marvel that young people are so attracted to these class warfare politics um, as if they were somehow that like they use it as a derogatory term um, whereas I think you know the, the class warfare politics of Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders, they, they seem to speak to a reality that young people are living, that you, you, you have a really good job and so does your partner and yet your prospects for owning a house are so far in the distance. Like, how can that be the case in a country that is so wealthy? How, how is it that we every day feel so limited in what we can achieve? Well, let's talk about, about those things and about the structural issues that, that are, in a way, putting a, a ceiling on people's ability to mm. achieve their dreams. Mm. Well, listen, mm. If you had to come up with a laundry list, and I think we just heard a few of them about what are some of the things that, that are the most, uh, the most difficult impasse for people, what, what's the ones that would be on top of your list for younger people? Yeah, I think it's default thinking. I think it's realising... I think it's listening to the media and listening to their parents to... Re I think young people need to understand that what got us here isn't going to get us there. Um, and we can rally against a lot of things and say it's unfair, but the truth is that what got us here won't get us there, I believe. Um, so what, what, give us an example of what you mean by so that. So if we just look at housing, for example. Okay. So I don't believe that housing is the answer for everyone. I don't think that owning your own home and that great Australian dream of owning <laughs> your own home is necessary for everyone. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. But I think wanting that or, or feeling like that's my, that's my right and I should be able to have it, I think that's the thinking we need to put aside and actually say, well, mm. what's right for me? In the life that I want to design and, what, and for what I have available, what's right for me? 
And that might be owning a home that I don't live in and taking advantage of things like capital gains, tax, concessions, but not ever owning the home that I live in. Um, it might be taking advantage of other concessions like super and the fact that potentially, I mean, millennials are the only generation that are going to have super paid for them from the mm. minute they start work. That wasn't available for mm. boomers. Mm. So how can, I, how can I ramp that up and have that there for me when I retire? So I think it's actually, if we remove the judgment and be curious about it and say, hey, how can I make the system work for me? I think that's the sort of questions we need to ask. David, the, the structural impediments that have been discussed or we're going to discuss were put mm. in place, I guess, with good intentions. For instance, mm. the idea of building a capital asset space for yourself through negative gearing. And, you know, that, that was uh, the idea that, you know, ordinary people could actually build, build some sort of to, wealth yeah. for themselves. Mm. Uh, but once you provide that to people, it's very hard to take it away. So how do we restructure such things in order to allow the next generation to get access to the same capacity building? I think there's, um, the, the, the conversation's actually changing a bit, Francis, and I noticed that in um, people like the Reserve, you know, Phil Lowe and before him, Glenn Stevens, <coughs> have spoken about this. So when you think about housing, um, and I think you might have been alluding mm -hmm. to it, uh, Melissa, um, when you think about the housing service of living, you, you can actually disentangle that from the investment decision. So mm. people have tended to, to fold those th two things together. So in other words, you know, through super superannuation, you could be invested in housing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you necessarily have to buy, buy your own house. We've now got two and a half trillion dollars in superannuation. 20 years ago, we'd had less than 100 billion. I mean, that's gonna be a fantastic asset base. Mm. There's all the talk about household debt and the like. So. That, that's one. So, so I think young people are at the great, have the great advantage of being able to think, do I want to rent or do I want to buy, mm. right? So in other words, if you don't buy, you've lost out on life. And I think that there would be a mistake to make that conclusion. Yeah, but making that cultural shift would be, is going to be extremely difficult because yeah. in the political process, even as we see it unfold today, it's still the <coughs> bedrock of what's being sold, that home ownership is the cornerstone of success, family and community. Yeah, I mean, I think culturally it would be an enormous shift in Australia to move away from that. I mean, if you think about it, though, owning a house mm -hmm. also symbolises putting down roots, starting a family, and all of that gets delayed for younger people mm -hmm. because of some really broad changes that have happened. So one is that there's so many more jobs that require a degree now. If you go back to 1970s Australia, mm -hmm. only 5% of 18 to 34-year-olds had a degree. Now it's around 40%. So people are in education for longer. Then you're coming out of education and often finding it very hard to find a job. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to find a whole bunch of short-term contracts. But then, you know, just myself as an example, at the age of 34, I have my first ongoing job. And I've delayed a whole bunch of things until then because I wouldn't feel secure enough to sort of settle down and start things. I mean, I think marriage age is another great indicator. So 1970s Australia, average age at first marriage was 23 for men, 21 for women. Now we're up to 32 for men, 30 for women. Um, and so it's about how long you have to delay things until you feel secure enough to settle down. And I think the house is a symbol is quite connected to that still. Is, is that partly because people perceive rented accommodation as temporary accommodation yeah. rather than yeah. their permanent accommodation? So that, you know, if, if you, in Europe or the United States, you can, you know, sign up to a five or a ten year yeah. rental agreement. So you have people think of it as their own home, right? The home where they're living in. They might not own it, mm. but they think of it as their own home. So, you know, we've all seen those movies where Americans move into their apartment Okay, I'm going to paint the walls and you know, and make it my own house. Whereas here, no, I don't really own it, so I don't really, I don't think of it as my own. So I, I think that's something that might change. We don't have the build to rent model here, mm. um, the role of social housing. So it's not changing quickly, but I think that will probably flow from the fact that, you know, it, uh, the average house price in Melbourne today is ten times average income, whereas 30 years ago, it was three and a half times. Now, I know mortgage rates have come off a lot. They're only about a third of the same level, but still, 
Housing is a lot less affordable today than it was back then. Although some of the economic theory is that the serviceability is the same mm. uh, because of the oh, low interest rates, yes. but it's still finding the deposit. Yeah. And that's the, that's the issue, it's finding the deposit. And it has to do with the supply of housing as well. That mm. affects the price. Mm. So, mm. you know, it's been market driven and maybe the government should be doing more to push developers, you mm. know, and, and allowing development. And we are seeing cases of that now around some suburbs where you're getting a lot more apartment development around mm. infrastructure, railway lines, schools, all that sort of thing. All the sort of things that actually affect mm -hmm. real estate values yeah. as well. Uh, it still remains an issue for younger people though, do, doesn't it, in terms of that cultural identifier of success of, of what housing actually means to you as a, as a professional person or, or what, what it means for family. It also has implications for community, does it not? If you buy a house, you, you tend to be, perm there's a sense of permanence, you're in, embedded in a community. If you are going to have a family, your kids will grow up within a community, there's a sense of stability. Uh, uh, younger people accepting that that stability is not going to be on offer to them or do they, do they still want it as much as maybe their parents or their grandparents did? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the solution to housing affordability is not that young people need to adjust their expectations. It's that we need policies and our government to take seriously. What does it... Like, how can you have dignity in rental properties? Mm. You can't at the moment. My dad rents still at 70 so years still old. So stigma associated And with he, you know, he, he he's rented his whole life. Mm. And he, you know, every two years or so... The landlord calls up and says, sorry, mate, you're out and you've got to get out within four weeks. He has no rights. Yeah, um, well, and well so that's 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 the indign... No wonder we, d we don't mm. want to rent forever when that is the reality of rental properties. And then at the same time, at every election, you have the government spruiking these generous tax concessions for homeowners um, and also putting property investment on a pedestal. So, I, like, the problem is not that... Young Young people need to adjust their expectations. The problem is that we need a government that takes seriously the concept of providing a roof over the head of every citizen in society. But that could also, that doesn't have to be home ownership. So that could be, um, I think, the adjustment of rental. Uh, and I think your point to your dad having to move every two years, I think policy around why can I go in my business and rent somewhere and have a 10 by 10 lease? But if I want to go and mm. rent personally, I can only have a one-year lease. And, and I, I can't I take my dog. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> what, what's to stop someone from actually approaching a landlord now and saying, listen, how about I give you a deal for five years with another five-year option on that? Because I think that landlords and the rental market is still a speculative in, uh, game. Yeah. And yeah. So, so the landlord is going to say, but I don't want to lock in for five years because in three years' time... I Maybe, believe my maybe but there will be times when it is... You know, it, they can do that. So would would a government have the courage to legislate in the way... I'm, I'm obviously, in a big city like New York City, you can have rent controls yes. mm. in certain buildings. What government's going to go to the marketplace or to you know, and sell itself and say, what we're going to do with all those people who've bought investment properties is cap what you can charge people? Imagine the political fallout oh, for anyone absolutely. offering that as an option. But I think there would absolutely be political fallout with that. But I think if a government came and said, we want to have people... You now have the option of renting for one year, three year, five year, and there's incentives if you offer longer lease terms, then I think that wouldn't be political suicide. I think that would be incredibly attractive. And mm. they'd find a base there that would really like that, both in investment property owners who want the security of a great tenant and the tenant themselves. It, it could be attract... It doesn't have to be um, a zero-sum game where, mm. you know, the landlord is the winner and the tenant is the loser. It can Absolutely. be attractive to both of them, I think, because yeah. what everyone, every property investor that I know talks about you know, th their, their risk is that people damage their property and having security and reliability of the tenancy is gold to, prop to a property owner. Mm. Someone would have to show some political courage to pass a law like that. And right <laughs> yeah. now, I think we're just using <laughs> how much in that short is in short supply. You never know who's in charge. <laughs> you never know who might pop up. Get your, <laughs> get your 43 <laughs> names on a piece of paper and you're going to be Insane. There are a lot of myths in, in this discussion as well. And the kid alt one is one that I know that, you, Sarah, you are you feel very strongly mm. about. Um, mm. The idea of younger people staying at home with their, with their families or their parents for, for longer than previously would have been expected. But my, my example, I, you know, I grew up in a house that was uh, any, at any one time there could be seven kids in the house, depending on which relatives were coming to stay. I got out at, just before I turned 18 and I grew up in, a, you know, in Broadmeadow. So I wasn't living in a, 
in, in flash circumstances, got out, couldn't wait to get out. But, you know, younger people now are staying longer and longer. Isn't that still a function of choice, though? Sure. I mean, there is an element of choice, but if you want to try and save a house deposit and go to uni, then you're going to... Most people are going to need to stay home. I mean, I think... The other thing to think about here is the way that the two generations are depicted in the media. Yeah. And I think millennials are really depicted as kind of lazy kid alts who just choose not to grow up. You know, it's these kind of broad stereotypes. Then at the same time, boomers are kind of depicted as greedy and wealthy. Mm. When we mm. know that, there's a whole lot of boomers who were not wealthy at all. And so mm. we see things like you know, incre the, the rates of first-time homelessness for over 50s are increasing, which is really worrying. And for women in particular. Women in particular, because, I mean, you know, a history of discontinuous employment, um, not having as much super, having done all this caring over their lives. And women, female boomers, which I'm just about to do a big research project on, they're particularly interesting because they've been called the sandwich generation. So mm. they're sandwiched between often caregiving for their elderly mm. parents, normally helping out with grandchildren as well, and sometimes even spouses. <coughs> um, so they're really sort of under pressure trying to do all these things, quite often still working. Um, and so the way that the media depicts boomers is kind of running around, being adventurers, <laughs> spending money on gym memberships and having a, you know, this positive ageing kind of message. There's a big group of boomers who just aren't able to do that. So we've got this, uh, I guess we're trading in wholesale cliches about the generations, aren't we? So how do we get to a point where we can have a more nuanced discussion about, you know, the, the structural economic reality for people is very different depending on you know maybe what your family circumstance is yeah. so you know for mm. for a kid going to a private school who's still facing the same sort of problems that we've discussed here with those economic impediments they've got more options though than somebody growing up in a housing commission estate or a first arrival person who's coming here as a as a refugee mm. so it's mm. not one size fits all in terms of some sort of battle between the generations mm. I mean, how do we get there? I don't know. <laughs> I think that um, political leadership, too much to 43 ask for. names on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, get I mean, it. I think it's fascinating, actually, because, um, uh, so I work at Get Up. Get Up is an online political movement. Um, we have, uh, we come into contact with about, or, 600,000 people every year um, and uh, but our membership is actually really fascinating for this discussion it's like we are bankrolled by boomers they are by far our biggest mm. donors um, but then we get heaps of our actions from young people and then it's your generation who <laughs> are largely silent mainly boomers <laughs> <laughs> because I think we I could think never be asked <laughs> we're the great so generation true. but I think that when you're you know when you're of a certain age you're raising a family and pursuing your career and it's in retirement or in your youth that you feel really energised and motivated to participate politically and mm. so um, I actually you know maybe the get up movement is like this beautiful synergy of boomers and young <laughs> people coming together <laughs> to change Australia with something better. Yeah I, I think we need to <laughs> tilt our policy towards encouraging housing supply. Now part of that might be social housing for people who are cl clearly out of the cycle of being able to rent or buy, but also to provide more housing because inevitably that's going to provide the accommodation whether for rental or purchase and help contain house prices. But the other side of that, David, is that these days because of the gig economy, and I want to talk about that in a moment, the, mm. the, the, the traditional structure of the financial system no longer allows or, or accommodates people or recognises the new reality of the, the mobile economy. So if you're working, like Sarah did, from gig to gig to gig until mm. the age of 35, you go to the bank and say, I would like a loan. They say, well, you haven't had permanent employment for two years. You, you can't get past square one. So how do we get the financial system to change to recognise the new economic reality I, to at I, least I, allow... I agree sort? it's not a quick solution. I agree. It's, I mean, but we've faced those issues for a long time with self-employed people, tradies and the like, you know, and they come to us for a loan. Mm. So, and, you know, APRA, the prudential regulator says it has to be responsible lending and so forth. But, you know, where there's a will, there's a way and there's a way around, around that. So, um, you know, we can, we can do that by looking at, you know, what their individual income is and the like. So, 
that that's not not something new. I agree, it's not easy. And um, banks are not always the fastest to move on that score. Yeah, they've got their own problems from that royal commission. I can tell you that. <laughs> I didn't mention that word. No. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, just from, from a personal experience, so we're just sort of discussing that. So the impact upon you as somebody who's obviously very good at what you do and quite successful, but still having to deal with the the structural challenge of the gig economy. I mean, look, I would. I've got a preface this by saying obviously I'm in a really fortunate position working in universities that, that, that pay well and you know I've, I'm lucky enough to um, own a property but because my partner had an inheritance early on and I have a partner I can do it with so I'm not by any means saying that I've particularly no. had it tough but I guess my case is just symptomatic of it being more and more common now for people to just have these short-term contracts and always waiting on, am I going to be rehired, am I going to rehired? And I think that often gets left out of the figures on casualisation. So there's been all this stuff at the moment of, oh, you know, casual work, casualisation hasn't changed in the last 20 years, it isn't growing. Well, if we go, so it's at about 25% now, but the change really happened in the 80s. So 80s, it was about 13% narrow at 25. So that has increased, but, Casual work, that doesn't include these short-term contracts. So they're full-time contracts, but they're only for six months or mm. only for a year. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, it just means that you're always waiting on, is something coming yeah. next, is something coming I, next? I, I guess we've been fortunate that apart from the early 80s and the early 90s, the economy has actually delivered pretty consistent job growth. I, I understand exactly your point about the casualisation fact that you know there was what one in four people part-time now there's one in three or thereabouts all of those things actually the um, the fastest area of growth has been in male part-time employment in the past 20 years which is which is an interesting facet of, of it as well but we're fortunate the economy has delivered growth in jobs if we hadn't had that then we'd be in terrible absolutely terrible shape and, uh, and you talk to people in different jobs casualisation and insecurity of employment is its just a fact of life, you know. But so is it? I mean, do we have to accept mm. that's the case? You you talk to younger people all the time. Mm. Uh, you, they're digital natives, so they've grown up in the environment where they, they, they understand the digital world. But do they, they've also grown up in the world of casualised labour. Do they accept mm. that as the norm or are they looking for something different? Yeah, it's really fascinating, actually. Um, so I do a bunch of hiring in my current role and... Um, I would say two years ago, whenever we uh, got young people in, everyone wanted to work on climate justice um, <laughs> and um, stop climate change. And over the past 12 months, I would say 95% of young people who have applied for a job at GetUp, when we say, what is your the issue that you're most passionate about that you think we can have an impact on? They answer economic inequality. Um, like everyone is sees it as the biggest challenge of our time, as the underlying causal factor behind so many of the other issues we face. Um, and I think young people, I mean, that just on the digital natives point, like I do think they exist within these online worlds and um, they have this sort of quite a nuanced and uh, inherent cynicism about the economy and, and the narratives about the economy that we've grown up hearing. So, um, you know, they see that their online lives are constantly controlled and curated by corporations. And, and so when we have the government telling us that, um, oh, no, the market is a, is a place of freedom, it's a, it's a liberating place, um, that it sort of doesn't ring true for young people because they see no actually like um, the market is a place of control and censorship and curating what I can see in my Instagram feed or what advertisements are being served up to me on Facebook. So I do think um, young people entering the workforce are doing so with a much sort of sharper critique and lens of economic justice issues more generally than they have in the past. And how are they going to organise to change that? You're, you're involved in organising and mm. getting people to to get involved in the political process, but not in the traditional way. They're not mm. going out and joining political parties, hence we have what we've got today, because uh, you know, mm. they're sort of like the core of what's left in the traditional political parties uh, are, mm. are the sort of rump, cynical narcissists who want to be in parliament. Mm. Um, so how do we change that? <laughs> how do we change that and get, and get young people involved in shifting the needle 
on policy if they won't join political parties and be involved? Because in the end, these things, thankfully, are still determined on the floor of the parliament. I mean, I, I think they are involved and they are organising and collectivising in different ways. Like, increasingly, these political flight, fights are playing out on online forums and they are the very spaces where young people have a competitive edge, uh, where they can speak in, in hashtags and memes mm. and, and whatever. Um, and so I think, I think the, the idea that um, young people are somehow being bypassed um, in the political process is incorrect. Like, I think that the political process is increasingly playing out online and that is where young people are. Um, I also think, um, like, you know, if I think about my aunt, she's a rusted-on Labor voter uh, and that is, like, a core part of her identity and young people don't, don't trade in those types of identities anymore. Um, they sort of have loose affiliations and networks of, of things that they're interested in and they will opt in and out at different times. And so they don't have that brand loyalty or allegiance um, to one particular organisation. So we're at GetUp, we see that like predominantly young people engage with us uh, on third party platforms, whereas baby boomers engage with us via sort of the GetUp website and the GetUp email list, whereas young people will be on Facebook where they'll be looking at a myriad of different uh, of different content. Um, and then, so, for example, the marriage equality campaign, like, young people opted into that issue and, and that campaign in huge numbers and we had young people organising calling parties and um, whereas our calling parties are usually, like, over 50s events, this, this was this astonishing turnout of young people people in our office every night. So I think young people are engaged and they are organising and they are collectivising and mm. they are having an impact on political process. Okay, I'll, I'll just take you on that one and just say, okay, <laughs> that, that issue of, of marriage equality is a, is a big thematic and, and it's an idealism, but who's going to do the hard work amongst young people to try to get the structural economic change? that they require, because that's not as sexy or, or, as, or as visionary. That's hard and incremental. That change isn't going to happen by just saying yes. Mm. So how do you get younger people engaged so that it's not just two boring old white men like we're going to see over the next little while, <laughs> Shorten, mm -hmm. Turnbull or whoever else that gets <laughs> thrown Or up. Julie. Yeah, well, Julie. <laughs> it could be Julie. If you, but, but you know what I mean? It's that yeah. thing where the young people need to be involved in the hard graft yeah. of... of the policy development and implementation, not just the not big thematic issues. It's not a vote to yes, where it's something you can get passionate and get excited about. It is it is a grassroots, longer term issue. But there are probably quick wins that you can have that young people can get behind. So it's a challenge, isn't it? It is. Actually, I think younger people have got a lot more power than they really yeah. un understand. Or it, it, um, this This is the generation for the... 15 to 25 year old nerds for want of a better better term right this is the generation of huge digital and technological change they control they're the, they're the I think they're the masters of the universe they just don't understand it or appreciate it just yet can we talk about financial literacy mm. because that's one of the things that I know that you're passionate about and yeah. it's one of those things that that younger people need in the increasingly complex world to get a handle on but how mm. financially literate are they well, the Hilda report last month showed that 15 to 24 year olds, less than, tw less than a quarter could answer all five questions. So tell us what the Hilda report is. So it was five basic literacy questions um, and it was put out just to, just to get an understanding of Australia's financial literacy. Um, so, and they were quite simple questions and 15 to 24 year olds scored worse. So less than a quarter could answer all five correctly. And the problem that I see with that is, for me, that's dangerous. Because if you're at a time where there's increasing globalisation, there's, incre there's AI, there's technology, there's a gig economy, there's can I afford to buy my own home? If I'm going to have to make these increasingly complex financial decisions, then I actually need a really robust level of financial literacy so that I don't just go to default thinking, so that I don't just believe the media um, because they're the ones yelling loudest, 24-7 news mm. cycle. They have to sell something and you can't afford to buy your own home sells. So it means that I, what I'm seeing in my business, which is the Money Bar, where we work with a lot of Gen X, Gen Y women, is they're believing that and they're opting out. So they don't have, they don't have great levels of financial literacy because it's not taught at school, it's not taught at uni. It's not sexy and exciting. We don't go, ooh, 
oh, wow, mm. I really want to learn about <coughs> compound interest or sexually transmitted <laughs> debt or whether debt's good, bad or okay or yeah. should I buy in my house or... Like, there are so many things that I think are incredibly exciting um, when it comes to financial literacy because that gives you choice. Um, and that protects you in relationships, that protects you and gives you options long term. So Has it that's, gotten worse? Oh, I, I believe so. Because mm. it's, it used to be far simpler. It was, we didn't have these portable selling devices. We mm. didn't have 24-7 credit. We didn't have, sorry, irresponsible lending. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no need to apologise. Sorry. <laughs> We I'll didn't come back to that. We didn't have <laughs> negative gearing and super. So it used to be quite simple. Should I save money? Should I buy a house? Uh, and, and there was a pension that we all relied on that was going to fund us when we retired. We don't have those basic tenants anymore. So we actually need to understand the complexity around what's going to be right for me and how can I build a financial model that will support the life that I want. So in a way, I mean, is it a case that, you know, too much information, overwhelmed by Absolutely. choice in, in, in this regard and trying to find your way through it? Mm, potentially. I mean, I think the not teaching about this in high schools is a pretty interesting one. Mm. I mean, I would have loved to learn about super and tax and all these yeah. things I had to figure out on my own. Mm. I mean, just look at the success of, well, your, your stuff, Melissa, but also the Barefoot Investor, who's this yep. mega celebrity in Australia. Yeah. But we buy the 10, book. 10,000 books a week. Crazy. That shows that we're wow. interested in financial mm. literacy. Mm. So. But we feel like we have to pick the most basic for dummies yeah. guide. Yeah. And that's wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing, just going back to the previous point about maybe why are young people less engaged in politics, I was, um, we had a tute this week, and I teach first years, so they're mostly 18, 19 year olds, and it was about um, how vibrant is democracy, and we were talking about why young people are disengaged, and a lot mm. of them very honestly said, I just don't know. I just don't yeah. know what I'm doing. I didn't learn about it in school. Mm. I wish I would have had some advice. I feel like it's better that I just put mm. in a donkey vote. Yeah. And we know there's high rates of donkey votes around among young people, which is really mm. worrying. So, yeah. I mean, part of it, yes, okay, we can't get schools to do everything. Mm. Um, but I think financial literacy as well, I mean, that's, that's a class issue as well. It depends mm. on yeah. what your parents Agreed. teach you and what's your cultural capital and what have you yeah. learned. And, I remember a, a friend of mine famously saying to me when I first I first had my loan and I had to understand what an offset account was. I had <laughs> to use my credit card so that I didn't take money out of my savings account. So I had to get my head around this. And I was talking to my friend about this and she said to me, Sarah, welcome to the middle class. <laughs> 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 yeah. But I think part of the problem with financial literacy is there's shame when it comes to money and there's shame when it mean? comes to some of these topics. I think mm. money isn't something that, it's something we're vulnerable talking about. If mm. I said to you, so tell me what you earn, you probably tell me to get stuffed because you don't, or if I said to you, I did a research piece earlier this year where I said, would you rather um, get naked in front of a room full of strangers or would you rather have your bank statements leaked? And 90%, I'd rather get naked, because wow. we would feel more we feel more comfortable getting naked than getting financially naked. And I think that that's the shame piece around. Yeah. You hang around with interesting people. No, I think <laughs> we're on it. We're in an Instagram generation where this is what we want people to see, and the reality of our lives are very different. I, I think so it's also crosses generations as well, mm. because I meet a lot of people who think, "Oh, my super," but it really. I don't want to worry about the super, yeah. I don't want to get involved, or where is the super invested? Um, because mm -hmm. that's sort of like a, I don't know what the, whether, whether they think of it as a dirty subject or maybe too complex. Mm -hmm. People should get involved. Oh. It's their money, right? So Never mind even getting to where it's being invested. It, it, I'm it, outraged on social media about big tobacco, but uh, my super's being invested. I mm. mean, let's get into that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> we've spoken about a lot of the, the tough things so far, and we're going to take your questions and we'll to deal with more of them. But I, I do want to talk about some positives as well, because there must be, there's got to be some blue sky here, uh, opportunity as much as there are challenges. So what are some of the things that millennials in particular have to look forward to? Well, the first one that comes to mind to me, which is the kind of flip side of the kid old thing, is a period that sociologists now call emerging adulthood. So having the cultural freedom in your 20s, 
to have a gap year, travel around, try a whole bunch of things. You know, even the affordability of air travel now mm -hmm. means that you can really go and see the world. And just this idea that it's sort of, and I know a lot of boomer parents encourage this with their kids, that it's sort of okay to go and explore and kind of find yourself and work on your identity before you settle down and do all these things. I mean, that's very exciting and a positive there's one. I found there's one. There's one. <laughs> Are you optimistic? I mean, you, you yeah. deal with a lot of change issues and wanting to change, yeah. the, you know, fundamental structures and whatnot. But are you optimistic that that change is coming and there's there are things for younger people to look forward to? Yeah, I mean, this shift in... Uh, so I think there's been this shift in what young people are interested in, um, which is has this really sharp economic critique uh, I at the heart of it. Um, and then I would also say we, um, so I used to be GetUp's uh, economics campaigns director and I used to joke that my job was to make tax sexy. <laughs> but we used to call um, the, our corporate tax campaign the gateway drug to economic fairness um, because if you got people in on corporate tax and these dodgy corporations that are avoiding tax and not paying tax, and then once they understood that fundamental concept it actually applies across the board to a lot of um, a lot of different places in the economy and um, over the past sort of five years our economic fairness campaign section has come to be just as big and profitable in terms of um, our ability to revenue raise on it and run big campaigns on it as environmental justice and as human rights and so I do think um, the way that people see their politics and the way they prioritise their issues has been to put this economic critique at the heart of what they're doing and people are really... I mean, you just look at the Corbyn campaign and the Sanders campaign. Like, Australia is trying to find its feet and work out what that's going to look like here and I really do think that change is coming. Do you think that that reaction to the... the that we saw in the UK with... Uh, with Jeremy Corbyn and, and the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign as well. Do you think that's going to last or build or, or was it... Uh you know, was it a protest vote that flared and will recede? No, I think um, what's being born out of those movements are this sort of cauldron of new ideas and, and radical ideas and, and, uh, and bold asks for what we think um, the type of country we want to live in are. So, yeah, like, why don't we have free, lifelong access to education and training? Why don't we have a roof over, a guaranteed <laughs> roof over every head? Um, there's been this, you know, war Where are over gonna come universal from? basic... Who's going to pay for them? <laughs> <laughs> the, the perennial question, well, <laughs> money is a myth, but we can get into that at another, <laughs> another wow. talk. <laughs> Let's go there with that one. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's aspirational thinking yeah. and, it's, and it's a genera you know, in a way it goes back to a different generation, of, you know, the, I guess the post-war generation came to a, a belief in a sort of a, uh, the Western social so can democracy. So you look at me, I'm, I'm well, fine with that. Well, you're a, you're a child <laughs> of that, but, you know, it was the welfare state, in a sense, that was built out of the, out of the post-war reconstruction, yeah. particularly in the UK and became part of our, our language in, in the States under Roosevelt as well in the New Deal. Yeah, and a lot of social change during that time. I've just finished w watching this Vietnam series That's on Netflix, right, yeah. which is a fantastic series. Mm -hmm. um, huge amount of social change. And on my university days... You know, uh, demonstrating about Vietnam, uh, Rhodesia, it was free Zimbabwe. So in those days, right, before it actually became Zimbabwe. So there's always been a lot of social change and pressure for social change. And, uh, you know, when you look at where society has come, I think we've made a huge amount of progress. So we shouldn't think about it as all... You know, we're, we're sort of like 5% on the scale. Yeah. Is there a, a dialogue between generations that's working? Because in order to do this, it can't come... You know, it, like most of our... When, when democracy is working best, it's incremental as much as that's frustrating because everyone has to buy in. Is there a, a strong dialogue between generations talking about what a, the give and get in order to make the life easier for the next generation coming through without asking for too much from those that have gone before? Look, I don't think there's a lot of dialogue. I don't think there's a lot of dialogue about money full stop, certainly not in our homes, um, because we don't necessarily know what to talk about. And to Sarah's point, um, I'm from the western suburbs of Sydney, certainly not something that we talk about. Um, and it, it is something where there is more of a, just an expectation to settle um, very much so. Um, but also I think that each generation is scrambling for themselves as well to some respect. Like the baby boomers are, oh my God, am I going to be able to have enough to retire? Am I going to be able to uh, retire even without having to this pension to rely on? The exes are 
scrambling in between the generations. And uh, I mean, we're the cynical generation, so we are um, uh, very much Seeing looking at home watching television. <laughs> <laughs> looking at it going, oh God, do we just hold on for dear life? And the millennials, I think, aren't talking to either as well because they don't want judgment. They don't want the finger pointed at them. Um, and I think there needs to be a better conversation where I think if the, the generations come together, it can actually be and have that curious conversation and have a creative conversation. Mm. It would actually be um, something really, really worthwhile. Um, but I just, I think there's too much, uh, these are the trenches that I need to be in and this is what I need mm. to be careful to look after me happening. There's probably also a wider reflection of how we now communicate. And part of the problem is that uh, we, we tend to now gravitate to tribes and, and speak in mm. silos. And you were talking about the curation of, say, Facebook feeds, or even Twitter these days will tell you what you can and can't see. Mm. So they're sort of blocking you off from, from, you know, from the wider conversation. You only get to hear yourself in an echo chamber. So how, how, what has that done for a, a wider discourse around how we make things better? Exactly what you just said. Mm. You're in an echo chamber and you get the news that comes to you, the things that you subscribe to. Um, and yeah, when I ask my students, oh, did you see on the news last night? They don't watch the no. news. They don't read the papers. No. But they do know what's going on because it's coming through mm. their social media feeds. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean they're disengaged, but they're getting it in different ways. But because of the way that works, you are, yeah, exposed to the same kind of messages again and again. How do you deal with that at GetUp? Because, you know, you're, you're selling a message or, or running a campaign, but how do you have a critical voice in there to, to keep you focused on the fact that you might be doing it right or that there's, there are, there are d differing points of view? Mm. I mean, I guess we are the bubble. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, like, I think that that is, that is the challenge, yeah. right? Because um, there are moments, there are political moments in which you need to rally your base and speak to your people and come together. Um, but there are also moments where you have to reach across the divide and be able to speak to people who come from different life experiences as you. Um, and I think, I mean, the power of technology to do those things, um, it's its scary the amount of access that we have in um, targeting different demographics, using uh, Google ads or mm. Facebook ads to speak to people and test different messages with them. Um, the like drastically reduced prices of, it used to be really expensive to do focus group testing and mm. polling and now you can do online polling and online message testing. And so I think that um, like th those things are really scary in the wrong hands and we saw that with sort mm. of the Cambridge Analytica scandal mm. and um, but I do think uh, with generosity and good intention there's actually a lot of scope with new technologies to be having those conversations in a meaningful way. Mm. Do you think government's interested? Do you think w all the policy settings we've heard about have been directed towards the notion of the family, you know, as the, as the same, you know, and, and that older generation? I think is governments have to be interested because there is this, uh, it's a large generation. We're not talking about a small generation, Gen mm. Y. This is a large group of people um, that are very active and that want their voices to be heard. I think governments have to get interested. Um, and I think already, um, I mean, I've, I know some of the policies that are already being brought up for potentially for the next election, um, can you things, share any with us? Well, <laughs> things like the, already we're being heard, we're hearing um, that negative gearing is potentially going to be scrapped. We're hearing there's changes to trusts. We're hearing changes to companies. There, are, these are big changes. All right, let's do a wish list. If you could, <laughs> if you could sit on, stand on the floor of parliament, have all the numbers, in, and 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 enact one significant change tomorrow, what would you choose? It's tough. You've got the magic wand. Uh, what are you I choosing? I think negative gearing would be a good one, but maybe raising new start. That's well overdue. Even it Howard is. says it's overdue. <laughs> <laughs> Same for you? Yeah, it's abysmal. It's it's absolutely abysmal. So for people who don't know the structure of that, tell people what, what happens when you're a new start. I can't remember. Do you know the dollar It's basically $40 a day, mm. which, and then you have politicians saying, oh, I can live on $40 a day. I'll have <laughs> rice and lentils. But that doesn't include living expenses and yeah. bills and all of this. Mm. And, and mm. it really hasn't changed in real terms for... I don't know. Someone else can answer. I think the last 40 I'm years or something. Yeah. Yeah. So new yeah. start and negative gearing. Payroll tax. I'd, I wouldn't touch negative gearing. I'd uh, change not? payroll tax. I, I actually think, I don't think ne negative gearing um, breaks our system, but I think 
things like making sure that uh, we have changes to the rental system so that we can have longer leases and that there are incentives for landlords to offer those longer leases. I think they're positive um, things, but I'd abolish payroll tax. And what would that do? Oh, it's, it's a disincentive for employers to employ people. So it's potentially higher wages. Um, it could potentially mean moving people from casual or for different types of employment to permanent employment. Um, certainly as an employer, I, it's absolutely a, disin it's a disincentive to But it's a huge grow. earner for the government, so we won't be able to, we won't be able, government. Won't be able to afford earner. our lifelong learning program no, that we've no. just invented <laughs> if we take away the payroll tax. <laughs> so we've got a problem. David, what would you choose? If you could, make, for, if you for, could change one thing. For me, tomorrow. Francis, it's, um, it's about the complexity of the tax system, which yeah, is just yeah. absolutely mind-blowing. Just think of, I know there's a lot of great people out there might be involved as tax accountants and the like, but... Um, when you think about mm -hmm. all the different tiny little taxes that go on that we have to comply with, the compliance industry and the like, mm -hmm. all well-intentioned, but um, we want a simple tax, which is, which is much easier to administer, much cheaper to administer. And what would and that do for young people? It'll help to create jobs, employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. OK, final question before we offer the microphones to you. What's your favourite smashed avocado recipe? <laughs> <laughs> do you go feta with a bit of daca? What are you doing? Sarah? I've already told you about this. <laughs> I like Vegemite on mine. Vegemite <laughs> toast? Oh, yeah, that's you know, awesome. I think there's a few people clapping there. Uh, rosemary no? and lemon. Mo rosemary and lemon? Mm -hmm. Ah, um, goat's cheese, avocado, poached egg. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> David? I'm more a guacamole on the tacos. <laughs> Brilliant, I'm hungry already. <laughs> Over to you now. Our panellists, you've heard uh, for the last hour discussing these issues. Um, uh, we've got two microphones, one on either side of the room. Uh, Alice and uh, Christina have them. Uh, we want questions rather than comments. Uh, and uh, please mm. uh, tell us who you are. I direct your question to one of our speakers and uh, we will start over on this side over here. There's a Thank you. My name's Julie and I'm a La Trobe alumnus from many, many years ago, and I really enjoy coming to these sessions. Now, from what people were talking about tonight, there's one thing that to me still doesn't quite add up. When you look around the new suburbs of Melbourne um, and new areas in regional towns and cities, there seems to be a huge amount of housing development, new houses being built, new houses um, being set up in areas where a few years ago, there was nothing but open bushland. Now, what I'm wondering about is, given the sort of economic scenario that we've been talking about here, who's building those houses, who owns them, who buys them, and who's living in them? Mm. Fair question, David. What, I mean, yeah, Melbourne's... All, I mean, for instance, mm. out in the western suburbs, uh, the suggestion is out in the city of Wyndham, where I was doing some work last week, that there's yep. a 1,000 people a week turning up yep. there to live. So it, there's, it's growing. So. What is, the, what is the sort of breakdown of, of who's getting access to that? It, 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 it's absolutely amazing, the growth. I'm not saying it's all good growth, but no. they're just gobsmacking the growth that's going on. So you were talking about, you know, the supply, Julie, of, you know, the apartments. You go to Box Hill and there's 40-storey buildings going up. Yeah, well, well, I was talking more of... Who's building it? Oh, single-storey homes? So the, the, the spreading growth of the suburbs. Yeah, well, it's, there's a diverse range of developers, you know, particular people um, who, are, who are doing the development, real estate, you know, Stocklands, Mervax, these types of people who are doing, doing the development. But the thing is, they're, uh, they're developing it for, um, you know, the population story. You talk about Wyndham, a thousand, what was it, a thousand week? A thousand a week, yeah. yeah. Victoria's growing by the size of Ballarat every nine months. That can't continue. Well, how do you do that and, and maintain the infrastructure and the supply? Mm. So we're still catching up to where we should have been 20 years ago on the infrastructure side. So is that mm. growth and that pressure on, on housing stock forcing prices up and making it even more difficult for young people? It's got people? to be, right? That's, that's my point about housing supply. Yeah. And housing supply with infrastructure to support it so people can live in good communities. So there's got to be a balance between the two. 
and good communities, I think, yeah. is, as well. I know in Sydney, and I'm I'm from Sydney, so apologies. You don't um, have to apologize. <laughs> <to Sydney. laughs> we have people from Sydney here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly we have. Um, it's the same way. We're scrambling to catch up. Mm. But it's also the infrastructure as well. So, yes, you may be able to live an hour out, but then the, stri- the yeah. problem then is getting to work. And if I'm living in the city, yep. sorry, if I'm living in the suburbs and working in the city, do I want to sit in traffic for an hour or an hour and 20? Um, and it's the infrastructure that's scrambling to catch up. Up, where you're actually looking at going, well, maybe I could afford out there, but actually that's not going to work the, for me. The positive thing the is now that that's become a retail political issue. Yes. So politicians are onto yeah. it now. Yeah. But it's one of those interesting issues that you raised, Julie, because uh, you know one of the, the easy throwaway lines about young people were, oh, that what they want to do is buy a you know a terrace house in Paran and be able to have their smashed avocado on toast yes. on a Sunday morning. They don't want to go and live in Point Cook and, and have a Nescafe 43 bean flavour existence <laughs> <laughs> as, their, as their first point of call. Yeah. And Vegemite toast. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, suburban sprawl really is a problem, and so we are going to need to get better at accepting that more of us need to live in apartments Correct. and to be filling in closer to the cities. Correct. I mean, at the moment, it's sort of two hours if you live out in Werribee to get in, in the morning. And I actually saw, I think one of the other things from the Hilda survey was that young people, the rates of young people getting their licences have dropped a lot. Mm. And they were speculating as to why, and partly mm. it may be environmental consciousness, but also it's just impractical to be, if you're living out there, to be driving in. What's a wasted money asset if you do the mm. sums on it? I guess if you want to use, you know, the, you know, drivers to drive you around, if you're paying Uber rather than paying insurance and mm. and uh, for your licence every year, it probably yeah, makes... Yeah, or public transport. ...economic sense. Mm. Yeah. I think we had a question from uh, over this side of the room, Alice. And I'm enjoying this and I'd like to um, ask a question or and, and make and within a comment, if you like. You mentioned that young people are very active and engaged and so on. I'm a university lecturer, uh, like some of you are, and I personally don't see that. Um, I really don't see that. If I ask questions, I don't get really good answers around these issues. Why do you think I'm in this situation and you're in another situation, or or do you... do you say, are you saying you don't get good answers around these issues or around broader issues? Around these issues. So around Particularly more around issues. Um, financial literacy yeah. um, and also uh, political knowledge, genuine political knowledge mm. of what is going on around them. Mm. What, do you, what do you think of my comment in relation to that? Who wants to take that one? I can comment on the financial yeah, pa- portion rather than the political. Um, certainly I think for financial, I think there's an overwhelm that's happening. So if I was to ask a question, if it was a basic, well, we, the Hilda established that basic literacy is a problem, but if we get to even more complex financial issues, it might be, well, actually, I don't want to look stupid, so therefore I'm not going to say anything. Mm. But also, I, I don't know, and I've opted out. So if I've opted out, which I see a lot um, happening with millennials, if I've opted out financially, because I generally don't think either I've um, got casual employment or I've decided just to press pause at the moment until the next stage, which the danger of that obviously is there's no necessary next stage yet, then I'm really not interested in the discussion because all it does is bring up all those feelings around, well, this isn't going to be helpful because I'm not going to be able to do anything meaningful about that, so why actually have a discussion around it? Certainly that's my experience mm. with the financial side. For the political, I'm not sure. Is it a question of forum? And where, where yeah. people mm, certainly smaller forums. So you obviously can. you're getting a yeah. lot of engagement from yeah. young people, right? I mean, I think... Um, with younger people, you need to meet them where they're at, in the spaces where they're at. Mm-hmm. And I do think there is sort of broad uh, cynicism and uh, scepticism directed at um, sort of more traditional forums of political discussion or, or perhaps that extends to academic debate as well. Um, And so while perhaps they don't want to put up their hand in their lecture theatre, that won't stop them from writing a sort of politically inflammatory tweet on their Twitter feed. So, I, like, I, I don't know the answer, um, but I think it is possible that there are just different behaviours and ways of political engagement that are being explored by this new generation that don't fit the, those old contexts that we're used to. And that's a great point. I, I had a lunchtime conversation with 30 um, 
Gen Y, where we talked about financial literacy. And, but the topic was why I think you need to break up with money um, and the psychology of money and the psychology of why you are perhaps behaving the way that you are. So um, what's your wealth creation values? Do you think money is good, bad or OK? You know, if money was sitting beside me and I was to describe my relationship with it, what would it be? You know, would I have blocked it on Facebook? Is it like a drunk aunt that gets out and embarrasses me? Is it healthy and loving? Um, and that conversation was a robust, really interesting conversation because that was one, you know, that was one that they could get behind. So I think we've got to have more interesting conversations about money too. That sounds like a great conversation. That was a cool <laughs> conversation. <laughs> we'll all be involved in that one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think there's a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, you go ahead, David. No, no, we'll I'm just going to say we'll quickly. We'll get the microphone to um, my anecdotal, you know, with, with, with graduates come into our organisation, you know, they do rotations and I must say, I've had some excellent graduates, but I've had the other ones that, you know, have asked me, oh, what is the cabinet? Or who is the government? And, and I think, has this person got a degree or do they not read their social media on, the, on their phones? I anyway. mean, I, I don't know. I would throw young people a bone on not being across political process when such a farce is being made out of political Yeah, that's, part of, that's part of the so issue. Why, why bother <laughs> to understand cabinet yeah. and... and like, I, I, I really think that... Do um, you think they should un know who the Prime Minister of the country is, though? Uh, yes, yeah. I... We don't have... Well, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's... I think you're exactly right. I think it's, I, I think it's a farce. I have opted out politically mm. so yeah. often. I donkey vote. I've donkey voted more often than I choose to count yeah. because I just don't... I don't believe we've been given It's partly options. because of the so leadership that we've had, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. And yet we currently have a Labor government who has the most progressive policy policy platform that a Labor government has had in decades. Um, and so clearly there is a political shift going on that is being driven from below. Like, this yeah. is not Bill Shorten exercising leadership. This is <laughs> him <laughs> reading the electorate and understanding that what is politically palatable right now is to shift to the left and start to take on some of these big economic reforms. Well, my chat, my comment earlier about negative gearing being removed, that's, that's Labor's policy yeah. that they're coming up with, it, they're coming with at the next election. We've so. got a question from uh, a woman in the middle of the room here. Uh, my one's slightly different. It's just in relation to um, young people and like casualisation of work. Um, one thing I haven't really noticed in this conversation that I'm interested in, particularly for you, Sarah, is um, the, the idea of like internships and volunteering. Mm -hmm. So I find, well, I'm 26, I find for myself and a lot of people my age, like I've just finished honours and stuff, I actually find it quite, it seems to be quite competitive. I don't know if it's particular to my industry, but even getting an internship, um, particularly if you're not doing a course um, where I know some courses they have uh, links with other organisations and kind of have a name to, you know, back themselves up. But if you're advocating for yourself individually, I just find I get knocked back so many times. And um, it's, it's, it's quite hard when I feel like a lot of young people... Uh, like, I've been in retail hospitality for, like, 10 years and I feel like that's a very common thing for a lot of people I know. So it's at the same time, it's working in very like having a very low income and trying to pay rent and also being like hey i'll work for free i'm trying to build myself <laughs> up and still getting knocked back like it's incredibly demoralizing that's a really yeah. interesting yeah. question because yeah. that's not the promise of higher education is it yeah. higher that's education right. is supposed yeah. to give you that opportunity mm. that that's right i mean these unpaid internships just the inequality in that i think is is really bad but if you can't even get the internship and of course all the jobs say well you need to have experience but how are you going to get the ex did you want to add sorry in? can i just say yeah. one more thing i'm also been wondering if the fact that like the fact that there are so many contract jobs and casualized ones i feel like the people who have a little bit of a foot in the door already they're kind of moving from job to job and they kind of possibly might have a bit of an upper hand because they've got their foot in the door already whereas if you're trying to start off they're obviously going to go for the people with the greater experience because they're just moving from one contract to the other. Whereas if you have no experience and you can't get an internship mm. or anything, then... Mm. Well, that point's yeah. interesting because the advice now is actually not to be too loyal and don't get too bogged down where you are because it doesn't look good on your CV. You have to show that you're flexible. And so as much as, yeah, quote, unquote, I saw you do that, <laughs> flexible, as much as we as humans don't generally 
many of us naturally feel like we want to do that, the pressure is on to show that you're a flexible employee and, and that you can adapt. But going back to your point before, um, I mean, I think this is something that universities are going to need to get better at doing. And we are starting to see more things like work integrated learning, which basically means doing placements as part of your degree, so you come out of it with some experience. I mean, the one bit of advice I give my students is if, not, I mean, not all students are at uni knowing what they want to do. But if you do know what you want to do, you want to, as much as you can, be getting any bit of experience you can during the degree. Yeah. Because this idea that you just finish it and you walk into a job is yeah. just not the case. Mm. Mm. It's another interesting issue that I'd like to raise before we go to the, to the floor again. Previously, people would organise to protect themselves against a situation like that. And organised mm. labour was you know, there to build some capacity within the workers to be able to not be put in those sorts of positions. Are young people interested in you know, old-fashioned unionism and organised labour, or is it, is, it, is it completely passed us by? Yeah, I mean, the union movement still has an incredible role to play in Austra the Australian political landscape, but, yeah, the facts of declining union membership are there. I think the only industry where union membership is going up is financial services, uh, and I think that speaks volumes about how the employees are feeling about their employers. Um, but, uh, like, I do think... Um, Is that a missed opportunity for millennials? Look, I, unsurprisingly, <laughs> would... Um, I mean, I would point the finger at the union movement, to be yeah. honest. Um, like, they are so archaic in so many ways. And, uh, you know, I'm a unionist and I was a union delegate and um, um, I have organised within my workforce. But I, uh, it's unsurprising to me that people feel uninspired by the union movement... Um, when I th I, young people have this really um, inherently sort of intersectional view of issues and so when you have a union movement that is wedded to workers' rights but won't budge on so many cl important climate issues because the CFMEU are holding them back, it is really hard for young people to sort of stake themselves on that as their, the place where they want their political affiliations to be. And the same thing when the union movement are putting out Facebook posts applauding Pauline Hanson for reversing her stance on penalty rates. When you have an intersectional view of issues and politics and you don't you don't like racist bigots, then you really don't... Then when the union movement are putting out posts like that, you think, well, you know what, that, that's not for me. I'm not going to join that mob. OK, mm. fair enough. Uh, we'll yeah. go to this side of the room. We'll come back over here. I think we've got a question just here, and then we'll go to the back of the room, and then I think... Maybe um, so as part of the intergenerational debate, we'll be talking a bit about how um, policy changes can help. Um, and one of the things that is concerning at the moment is that we've got an ageing population. We're getting to the point where the ageing population is essentially the retirees are going to overtake um, in numbers the people who are working. Mm. How does that affect policy, the fact that the people who are working just don't have as many votes? Um, and, and how does that affect the way... Or, or first of all, do you think it's likely um, with the rates of immigration? But also, um, you know, how, how do we overcome that? How do we address that? So I think, um, I think part of the problem in its simplest form is social media is dictating policy. You know, we've had, uh, we were talking here earlier, how many s uh, leadership spills have we had in the last decade? How many prime ministers have we had in the last decade? How long has social media been around for? So it is almost who's yelling the loudest. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, um, I think it's a huge problem. I think that the pension, which we used to see as, well, this is the right, if you work really hard, this is something that we can rely on. I think it's something that for young people, you actually need to understand that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be relying on it. I wouldn't, I'd be working and saving and relying on my super and believing that that pension's not going to be there. Because yeah. I just, I just think there are some fundamental shifts that are going to happen as a result of this ageing population that we're going to have to support that didn't have the luxury of super um, to support them for a long time. So I think it's going to, it's going to, be enormous as far as policy change David, is concerned. David, it's a really interesting point, because the, the, I guess be careful what you wish for. Our medical science is allowing us to live longer, yeah. which is mm. pushing out the, the, the time for that asset transfer that traditionally might have provided mm. a you know, financial underpinning for the next generation coming through. That's not happening in the way that it used to. And so, therefore, 
uh, younger people are being you know, asset poor for longer as a mm. consequence. And it's, you know, we are aging. I mean, everyone's aging, but um, state the obvious. But um, you know, the 65 year age limit, which most people have thought of as the retirement age, that was set in the first 20 years of the 20th century. Yeah. So what the treasurer then went to the government actuary and said, what is life expectancy? He said, 65 years. We'll set the pension age at 65 years so we won't have to pay much in terms of age pensions, <laughs> right? Now, life expectancy has increased, what, another 20 years, say? Mm -hmm. 15 or 20 years? And you're actually finding right now, it's, it's an interesting point you raise because the participation rate, that is the engagement of the part of the population in the workforce, is still rising at this point. Now, we know the big story in the past 20 years has been increased female participation, but even male participation, particularly uh, in, um, in, in older age groups, is increasing. So times past, we would have thought 65, the participation rate plummets. It's actually, it's actually increasing, and there's various reasons. Life expectancy is one of the reasons. Um, Lower wage rises is another, right? So people saving for their retirement. So it's, um, it's, it's an interesting point. It's tough. I've got a question down here. Um, thanks for tonight. It's very, it's very interesting. Um, I'm studying a Master's of Journalism at La Trobe. My undergraduate was economics. So this is my jam here. Well done. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I was encouraged with the there's no zero sum game with landlords and tenants. But then as soon as we got to the pointy end of what would we do with New Start and we started talking about cash, it became, sorry to single anyone, it became who's going to pay for it. So we went zero sum straight away as soon as we got to dollars. How can we make a campaign approach that says this is, this is a shared goal to have everybody have an access and opportunity? How can that be, how can we sell that? I, I think it... From my own point of view, I'm not an expert in um, tenancy regulations and all of those things, but if they're inhibiting the ability of landlords to extend lease times and the like, then that, those sort of things have got to change, right? So at least you're creating the, the policy groundwork for that to change. And I think, as I said before, there's big advantages for landlords in having longer leases and more reliable tenants. Definitely. So who can sell the advantages to the everybody to have a larger middle class, to have access to education, to have housing, to have better social cohesion, like surely that's positive for everybody. But now mm. you were talking about that being the underpinnings of the success of the Corbyn and Sanders campaigns. So they were selling that message mm. and Jeremy Corbyn got very close to being elected. So there is a way to sell it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the way we have fallen back on because if you talk about any issue in isolation then you do eventually run into this well how are we going to pay for it um so we for example we just launched our future to fight for agenda um which is 10 new bold ideas about new economic policies for a more just Australia. And they are things like uh, federal job guarantee or lifelong, lifelong access to education and training or... Um, and But how do we pay for them? Well, in part, these things pay for themselves. Um, they generate additional economic activity. If we're retraining people, um, then they're re-entering the workforce and then giving back through tax. Um, they're also doing work, meaningful work in our communities um, that needs doing. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I think um, we need to think about taxation as more than just the way we collect revenue, but also about an instrument for how we create the type of society we want to live in. And so so it's not just about how do we collect the minimum amount of revenue, it's, well, no, we want to cut in there and we want to change that and we don't want those people to have too much wealth, so we want to take back some of that. And I think thinking about a holistic conversation about not how do we tinker with the edges of negative gearing or how do we reduce this super tax concession, but holistically, how do we build an economy that serves people rather than people serving the economy? Got a question here. Hi, uh, my name's Leah. Thank you so much for your time, by the way. It's been a really fascinating discussion. Um, my question is for Natalie and the panel as a whole. 
I know we talked about the, the plebiscite earlier and I know there was a huge influx of younger voters registering to vote. How do you think that will manifest at our next election and do you, do you think that those sort of policy changes, rental reforms, uh, the economic changes we've been discussing tonight, do you think that those are the sort of things that will be able to take effect with a boost from younger voters or do you think that it won't have that much of an impact? I mean, I think there will definitely be a bearing on the election, um, but probably not electorally significant in terms of uh, it's mainly the same marginal seats that determine um, the election. Um, but I do think, um, as I was saying earlier, like Shorten's shift to the left is significant and we shouldn't underplay the importance of that. Um, we've had, you know, I grew up um, sort of in the neoliberal consensus um, where I grew up with very strict ideas about what the economy was for and how we talked about the economy and I think that is, it's really radical that that is undergoing change right now and um, we're starting to see the breakdown of that sort of bipartisan commitment to neoliberalism. You still, if I get in a room with Chris Bowen, he still like talks at me about the, like the market um, but I do think there are elements of even the Labour Party, which is a still a very conservative political institution, but there are elements of the Labour Party that are beginning to explore um, more radical and interesting ideas about um, economic policy change. So I, I do think, I do have hope um, that if we see a more progressive government elected and several terms of a more progressive government that uh, there, there may be some um, significant economic reforms. See, the way we're going, one full term would be a miracle. Yeah. It'd be great. <laughs> Wouldn't it, Just? I think we've yeah. got some questions from this side of the room. Hi. Um, I'm an honours student at La Trobe University, and um, I think the first question is a perfect segue to my question, but for those of us who are looking to buy a home in the future, we are very much aware that the price is increasing over time, and of course, with the economy, prices do rise, increase in wage, things like this. But something that hasn't been mentioned is perhaps international investment into big complexes or homes, huge homes, um, and that's also increasing the price in general. Do you think this needs more regulation and do you think this impacts this conversation at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely, I think. Uh, and I, I know that there's certainly been moves to if you buy a home, you can't leave you can't leave it vacant. You have to tenant it because otherwise, that's just adding to our problem of who wants a whole lot of overseas investment into homes to just sit there and no one's in it. I, I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm very um, loath to regulate. Uh, I would probably sit a bit further apart when it comes to that. But, but when it comes to foreign investment in things like property, I think that absolutely needs to be watched. But I, I think we can extend that to foreign investment in our farms. And um, there is so that, that's such a broader conversation around what we're giving away and how we're going to sustain ourselves in the future. I think property is such a thin end, uh, edge of the wedge when it comes to foreign investment and what Australia will look like in 50 years time and how we are going to what we're going to be left with and how we're going mm. to feed ourselves and I think that's I think you've probably started a whole debate um, there with that question yeah mm -hmm. we have a qu uh, another question from uh, up the back row there thanks very much to the panel um, I'm a bit like you Frank in this sort of sandwich generation I have an 88 year old father and an 18 year old son mm -hmm. and one of the things I'm thinking a lot about is how to get those two groups talking to each other or communicating some sort of in intergenerational dialogue. And I've seen a few things on Facebook that are around uh, sharing accommodation, where the, the older person has mm -hmm. the accommodation and they need somebody yep. to come in mm -hmm. and yep. assist them either with their living or with their maintenance, or, and the younger mm -hmm. person has the need to yep. have somewhere to stay at a reasonable rate. Have there, anybody had any experience with that sort of uh, uh, social housing type setup? So innovative approaches to, to meeting mm. those needs. It's Use of housing. Yeah. I know they've, I, if anyone can remember where it is, just yell out, but I know there have been experiments with this overseas. Holland, mm. Holland, and they've seen good results. And there's some interesting stuff in Japan around using an app where if you don't live near your grandparents but you want someone to go and support them, yep. you kind of 
not pay, but you trade for someone to go and do something for them and then you do something for their grandparents. Like yes. yeah. yeah, so there have been some innovative things happening. Look, over time, there's been lots of instances of you used to rent out the little shack at mm. the back of the and house, the right? The yeah. granny flat at the back of the house. Mm. And there's nothing to stop <coughs> homeowners who are feeling the stress of the cost of living uh, actually renting out a bedroom right mm. now. In fact, a lot of them are doing it. It's called Airbnb, <laughs> right? And, um, mm. you know... True. Absolutely. Um, underst I understand all that. But um, so there is... It, it, but, you know... The Politicians can push this a little bit further, you know, m maybe through tax changes or, or whatever. The but creative it, solution yes. to our problems. And for me, that's a creative solution to what are we going to do with this aging generation where we don't want to build these complex retirement homes because then who's going to fill them Exactly, they're the most depressing places. <laughs> Plus, when that large uh, group goes, that they're just going to be left there empty. So this is a, an interesting way to hear, can we solve this problem yeah. and we can also you solve this You want to bring the problem. generations together, yeah. not apart. Mm. Yeah. We've got time for maybe two more questions from the gentleman in the middle and one at the back as well. Uh, thanks very much for the great talk. Um, I, David, you can mention a couple of times about housing supply. Um, I look at my parents, um, they live in a gigantic house um, out in Preston with, you know, it's you know, probably 50 metres by 40 metres. They've got eight bedrooms, the two of them living there. Mm. Um, they've talked about downsizing to an apartment forever, um, but they never do. Mm. Um, why in this discussion is there no serious talk about uh, land tax? Yeah. Um, and, sorry, and, and by that, uh, incentives to downsize, uh, to use land smarter. Yeah. Look, there's, there's different ways of thinking about that. There's a lot of emotion in this as well as the financial aspects of it, which, you know, which, you're, which you're alluding to. From that, I, I mean, when you're thinking of... I, I spoke before about um, uh, unpacking the the living um, you're getting out of your house and the investment decision. So, there's, so most people have sort of put the two together and think, if I want to, you know, my housing, you have to buy a house. Well, you don't have to buy a house. So when you're thinking of, our, you know, our parents, um, may, maybe one choice, and, and I know it, it raised a lot of emotional issues because of the family home and all those sorts of things. Mm. One might be to share it with other family members. Uh, another might be to say, I'm not going to sell the house, it's going to stay in the family, but maybe I'll go and rent somewhere else. If I can get a long-term rental, maybe it's nearby, something like that. So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing sort of solution, but you know, the whole intergenerational thing and you know, people reaching that age where maybe they need some help and often they're frightened or they, they don't want people to come in and help them, you know, get the occupational therapy help that they need. So a lot of services out there to help people, you know, live their lives a lot more usefully. Can I say as well what you're suggesting is a, a stick approach? So you're saying, why don't we tax them and get them out? Well, I actually think, well, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't be forced out because this is their home and their emotion as well. So I prefer the carrot approach and that's, there is actually a solution on the table at the moment. So it's the downsizing contribution. So at the moment, the government has allowed that if you downsize and you sell your home, um, you can actually put a chunk of that money into super. And certainly for boomers where they didn't have yeah. that option early on, you're able to contribute into super and, and take advantage mm. of that and actually sell an asset and then free that up yeah. and downsize and go into an apartment. So there have been current approaches They've to it and I always prefer... They've tried mortgages and they haven't proved to be yeah, popular, you know, because you're just leveraging up yeah, the, exactly. the house again. But I like the carrot versus the stick. Mm. Final question, because we've, uh, we've hit... Uh, Hello, um, Jacob from the Supreme Court. Thanks very much to the panel. I was just wondering, how much do you think it comes down to culture? I think there's a lot of multicultural, young multicultural Australians who receive a lot of support from their, from their parents, and they have quite open um, discussions with them about finances, about providing them with a property at a young age, and about property investment. Is it, as was mentioned before, is it too much of a taboo and a stigma in Australian culture about speaking with our parents about finances and about buying property? Is that what the, what the issue is and why there's such a divide between the generations? Yeah, it's a reminder once again that uh, when we talk in broad terms, we're yeah. sort of missing the, 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 the different uh, hues and colours within. Absolutely. And I think, um, I don't necessarily think it's a parent-child stigma. 
Um, and if anything, the child may not want to talk to their parents about it because they're just tired of the judgment of when are you going to move out and buy your own home. <laughs> they're thinking, well, when I get a full-time job and I can save a deposit mm. and maybe you stop buying investment properties, like it can, can become a real uh, between that. I think the vulnerability and the shame and the stigma around money is having conversations with peers. Um, so that's not happening. So I think it's, a, it's not just a generational conversation we're not having, having when it comes to finances. I think it's a conversation about finances full stop, which is why I love that this conversation is happening today about money, because it's just not happening in a robust, interesting way. Mm. And, and I know Smash Davo sparked the conversation, but I have to say I, it's, you know, we get fixated on property. Um, and that seems to be the thing in Australia that we talk about, to have a robust conversation about money and all its facets and um, the things that you can invest in and the different ways that you can use money as a tool to get you to the life that you want. That's what I think is a far more interesting conversation. But well, I'm, curious to I'm glad we were able to have that conversation here <laughs> yes. tonight. I want to thank our panellists for, for being with us. It's uh, an issue that has been uh, discussed widely in the public, but not, I don't think, in the same depth and with the same level of uh, nuance and intelligence that it needs. And tonight was a way to do that, to discuss the challenges that uh, millennials face, but also the opportunities available to them. And also, from the boomers' perspective as well, what uh, the future looks like for them and how they can come and meet halfway with those that are coming behind them. Thank our panellists for being here tonight. Give them a big round of applause. David, Melissa, Matt and Sarah. And uh, we're not that far away from our next Bold Thinking series events, which is happening on Thursday the 20th of September uh, here in this theatre. Embracing the F word. Has fem feminism had its day? That's going to be a fiery conversation. Professor Jenny Gray, Dr Beatrice Albert, Claire Bowditch uh, and Bri Lee will be here in discussion with myself for that one. Tickets are already available, Christina, via the Bold Thinking website. Uh, so make sure you come along to that one. And then hot, off the heel, hot on the heels of that one, the climate change emergency, what can be done? Um, a conversation Tim Flannery will be having with Professor Robin Eckersley. And that's at uh, Cinema 2 at, uh, at Acme down there at Federation Square. So having a big September. Thanks for being here. And uh, also, you can also go to the website. The podcast also available on the Trobe University website. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, search for Bold Thinking. And uh, yeah, if you've got other people you know who are interested in this topic and uh, want to enjoy the conversation and might learn a little bit from it, make sure you let them know. Thanks for being here this evening. <laughs> <laughs>